Okay, wonderful. So uh, for those that don't know me or are not familiar, I am a functional medicine physician uh, practicing in South Carolina. I have two offices, one near Myrtle Beach and one near Charleston. And that's uh, home is Charleston, actually. So uh, it is Carolina Holistic Medicine. Uh, the practice started in 2013, so we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary. Prior to that, my first career in medicine was in the emergency room. So it was a very traditional allopathic ER career that spanned almost 20 years. During that time, it was the late 90s, I knew there was something better that we could be doing for our patients. Not so much the lacerations and gunshot wounds. We kind of got that down pretty good in allopathic medicine, but it was the chronic care, diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure, strokes, heart attacks, those kind of things that I was not happy with uh, as far as my medical school and residency training fell very short. So I developed a curriculum um, in the late 90s that took me around all over the country to different conferences and hence I became an integrative holistic and what we now call functional medicine. Although what I practice is what I refer to as reformed functional medicine. I'm also a, a big prescriber of low dose naltrexone. I know Linda Elzegood, the director and founder of that organization. It's a nonprofit organization located in the United Kingdom, but has an international presence. And Linda is a wonderful person and she got me in touch with the group here to present but I'm on their medical advisory board and I'm one of their routine lecturers and writers. I did contribute um, a chapter to the third LDN book and we'll talk about that in a bit. I also am an affiliate and uh, official advisor with the FLCCC, that's the Frontline COVID Critical Care Alliance and they're the group amongst a couple, very few others that came out with early treatment options for COVID, COVID-19 during the pandemic. And now there um, there are vanguards of information, truthful information about early treatment, the medications that have been rolled out by pharma, and also the vaccines. Um, so um, I'm, I'm affiliated with all those. What I'm going to do is basically talk about some novel treatments, uh, including low-dose naltrexone, cannabinoids, uh, CBD, if you will, peptides, healing peptides, rapamycin, amloxanox, and I'll make mention of methylene blue as well. So um, fibromyalgia, by definition, I probably don't have to define it for this group, but there's a lot of overlap, the same kind of overlap that we see when I deal with Lyme patients, people with mycotoxin illness, people with heavy metals, people with EMF sensitivity, food allergies, leaky gut, uh, chronic um, inflammatory response syndrome, or cirrus, as well as MSEDS, multi-system infectious disease syndrome. These are all fancy words for sometimes the same thing. We also see overlap with uh, things like MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome, POTS, EDS, and a few others. So if you develop a Venn diagram sets, you'll notice a lot of the, there's a lot of commonality under, in other words, under the same uh, three circles, if you will, of common things. And that's what we see also with fibromyalgia and MECFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, myalgic encephalomyopathies. Um, there is some overlap, but there are differences. So the overlapping symptoms are pain, fatigue, brain fog or cognitive dysfunction, uh, sleep disturbances, uh, hormonal dysfunctions, things like that, immune dysfunction. Uh, and a lot of times they coexist to a large degree that it's very difficult to sometimes separate them out. I have folks coming to see me with long COVID and uh, they have underlying Lyme that we discover for them. And it's sometimes difficult to determine what's giving them the big problem. Is it the Lyme or is it the COVID um, or the vaccine injury? So the differences between fibromyalgia and uh, CFS is that there's something called substance P, uh, which is increased in the cerebral spinal fluid of patients in some studies they've done. They extract some through a spinal tap or lumbar puncture, and it's present there where it's not present in people with CFS. Uh, so that is one discrimination thing to discriminate one from the other. Also, if you look at the RK criteria for sleep, it's a sleep criteria. If you look at the very basic criteria, it, it, there's no difference between uh, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. However, if you use more advanced 
uh, analysis of sleep patterns. It's actually the transitional patterns of sleep going from light sleep to heavy, you know, the, the different stages in REM sleep. There are differences uh, between those two populations. And this is outlined in a couple of clinical trials that I have put at the bottom of my slides. So um, uh, just a disclaimer about that. Um, not everything that's in the peer reviewed literature is good stuff. There's a lot of crap that's published, um, a lot of falsifications we've noticed in recent years. And one other disclaimer, I would hope that people use this as informational only and not to use it as a, you know, my establishing a uh, patient doctor relationship. That's not what this is about. This is educational purposes only. And please, if you want to start something, make sure you go to a qualified practitioner, a uh, licensed practitioner to help you along the way. I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Um, okay, let's move on to the next slide. So theories um, on causes. Um, so viral and non-viral infections. You have um, uh, things like a virus can cause a mediated deficit in T-cell activation, uh, things like Epstein-Barr, CMV, HHV6. And now to that list, we can add, add the SARS-CoV-2 um, and other viruses and, and illnesses. Viral in injury apparently um, gets in the way of cellular calcium channels and thus neuroendocrine dysregulation and serotonin deficiency. You get the disruption of the HPA axis, which knocks out a lot of the things like adrenal uh, function, thyroid function, gonadal function. So all the um, hormones associated with those glands in the HPA axis can be disrupted as well as the sympathetic nervous system. You see folks with low growth hormone levels and we don't really measure growth hormone specifically because it fluctuates. You get uh, uh, spikes and troughs throughout the day many, many times. It's better to measure uh, IGF-1, uh, which is growth hormone gets sort of converted into that, if you will, in the liver and it's a more stable um, thing to measure. So IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, as well as insulin-like growth uh, factor binding protein three. So you have a decrease in IGF-1 and sometimes an increase in IGF-BP3 and um, a corresponding rise in cortisol, one of the stress hormones, and then a drop in your norepinephrine production. There are some genetic defects that are have been implicated, Serbs A, beta, and alpha genes, uh, and they actually code for a thyroid hormone receptor. So you get low affinity for thyroid hormone receptors yielding a functional hypothyroidism. When I say functional hypothyroidism, that means that the lab test may be normal, a normal in-range TSH, and a T4, a T3, reverse T3 might all be normal, but the person presents with hypothyroidism. It is common that family medicine, internal medicine, and in, even indro will only measure TSH and T4. That's what insurance pays for. However, that's not sufficient. If you listen to any of my thyroid lectures, you know that you need to check free T3, T3, T4, reverse T3, amongst other things, iodine, selenium levels, iron, magnesium. So those can all be affected by uh, some genetics and make one predisposed to have low thyroid function, even at the receptor level, uh, not only at the production end. So tick-borne illnesses, that's another non-viral illness, although there are some viruses transmitted by the tick bite, up to 18 things can be transmitted by a single tick bite. But we're talking about Borrelia, Bungdorfii, or BB, Babesia, which might be the second runner-up uh, co-infection, and Bartonella, which can cause um, a lot of mood disorder and behavioral problems. Heavy metals, especially mercury, uh, can be um, uh, an agent that um, causes uh, fibromyalgia. And then a reduction in your RBC tagged or erythrocyte magnesium levels, an increase in homocysteine. Homocysteine by itself is an inflammatory marker, and we sometimes see some inflammatory markers rise like myeloperoxidase, interleukin-6, fibrinogen, and some others. But in this case, homocysteine, uh, made up of two amino acids, cysteine and methionine, if they cannot be degraded or broken apart, they sort of build up and they can cause all kinds of trouble. They're an indicator of how well the methylation pathway is doing. That's your detox pathways. And then you've probably heard of the MTHFR gene. So the MTHFR, along with MTR, CBS, and a few others, 
will code for proteins involved in the activation of inactive folate uh, or like folic acid to methylfolate and part of the uh, methylation pathway, important in the Krebs cycle, important in ATP production. And we see folks with um, fibromyalgia that have low ATP, low energy or fatigue. So measuring homocysteine and then treating it appropriately to lower it if it's elevated, typically if it's over the level of nine, uh, we'll want to address that. Also checking things like vitamin D and folate and B12 and B6 levels, all very good. And even uh, you will see an abnormal cellular carnitine metabolism that has been implicated in fibromyalgia. So I'm going to jump from that into treatment and interventions. Um, so LDN or low dose naltrexone is on the top of the list. It is one that agent, it's a synthetic drug, was created in the early 1960s, mostly used back then for addiction, opioid addiction, later alcoholism, food addiction now um, is one of the newer FDA approvals. However, it was during the 70s and 80s when they were writing these this drug for folks that were heroin addicts or opioid uh, addicts, people with HIV that were hooked on uh, intravenous um, a opioids, uh, that they noticed, especially amongst the HIV AIDS population, that their AIDS was becoming better controlled. Um, and it was Dr. Banhari in New York who first realized that in this country. And then the European doctors noticed it in the 70s and 80s while riding this drug in high doses, 50 to 300 milligrams a day, that a lower dose, i.e. something around one milligram to even half a milligram all the way up to about four and a half, five milligrams per day, did something quite different. Wasn't really used in those low doses for addiction, but it helped with autoimmune and immune dysregulation. And so hence the term low dose naltrexone. There's VLDN, very low dose naltrexone, and ULDN, ultra low dose naltrexone. An organization was created a, uh, a couple of decades ago. Actually, there are two non um, profit organizations. One is the LDN Research Trust.org, which I'm affiliated with. The other one is the LDN Science.org, another one in Europe. And they publish a lot of material on their websites, reference material. Everything's backed by science here, not just conjecture or wishful thinking. So um, there are Dr. Younger and uh, Dr. Brune are, are referenced here um, where they've studied LDN uh, for. Uh, fibromyalgia pain and some of the other symptoms. Okay. And LDN is used for a lot of different things. There've been three books written, uh, the LDN book, volume one, two, and three. The third one just came out last December, about a year ago. And um, I did a chapter on longevity, but there are chapters on how it's used in thyroid dysfunction in cancer, um, in cancer uh, and chronic pain states. So very interesting stuff. And as a standalone, that's my first go-to with someone with chronic illness, not limited to fibromyalgia, but including. Now, cannabinoids or CBD, well, there's CBG, CBN, CBS. There's all kinds of cannabinoids, probably over a hundred different cannabinoids that we know about. More have been researched than others. Um, and they are also uh, things like Delta-8 and Delta-9, THC, or even hemp, full spectrum cannabinoids or very specific ones. And they are very helpful with pain, with depression, anxiety disorder, with insomnia. All of those things that you see in uh, fibromyalgia patients. It's well researched and the use of cannabinoids for controlling pain in fibromyalgia is pretty widespread. A lot of people can get these agents over the counter so a lot of them are, are self-prescribing without the need for a clinician's involvement, but it's always best to, uh, you don't want to be picking up your cannabinoids at the gas station or the 7-Eleven. You want to make sure that it's pharmaceutical grade, very clean, well-processed, make sure it's in the proper carrier oils. We have uh, two companies we use routinely, um, and one uses hemp oil as the carrier protein for their, uh, I'm sorry, carry oil for their um, cannabinoids. And it's very helpful when it's paired up with naltrexone. So the use of LDN and cannabinoids is, is much more effective. I use that combination in a lot of my patients 
and there's timing involved. There was a study published in some cancer survivors, and this is related to the use of LDN, which is anti-cancer, and cannabinoids, which is anti-cancer, paired up on cancer survivors to look at recurrence rates. And it turns out there were different, four different cohorts. Uh, the cohort that did the best was the one that had the LDN first. Then there was several hours gap between the, the um, taking of the CBD. And it turned out that those patients in that cohort had a far lower a recurrence rate of cancer, a reduction of something like 22%, where the next one was uh, something like 18%. Um, so there's some references there too. Again, there are caveats with cannabinoids and Delta-8 and things like that. And I have my favorite uh, two companies that I'll uh, identify at the end of this program. All right, healing peptides. Oh, let's make sure I didn't, yep, healing peptides. So story on peptides is they've been researched for over 30 years, starting in the former Soviet Union. They're very safe. We make them ourselves. Uh, they, you can't overdose on them. Uh, they are very, very helpful and they get pulsed. You don't take this uh, like a pill or a shot every day for the rest of your life. You do it for two or three months and you can switch to a different one or you can use several in combination and then you can move on. Uh, sometimes you might have to revisit it in a year or in six months, but it's not something that you take every day ongoing. Um, a caveat here, a few, uh, several weeks ago, maybe a month ago, the FDA came out with an opinion uh, and a warning that uh, some of these should not be used in humans, which is totally silly and absurd. Uh, they're, they're very safe and they work um, and much, much safer than some of the other drugs the FDA approves. And mind you, these are not drugs. These are natural agents. They are derived in the laboratory, things like BPC-157, body protection compound 157, TB4 frag, uh, oxytocin, LL37, simorolin, uh, there are some nasal ones that you can spray up your nose like C-Max and c -Lank. So there's a hundred plus peptides that we know about that are used medicinally. And it's very tricky. Um, you have to know what you're doing and find a physician that can give you guidance. The problem is nowadays is sourcing them. Most of them are given subcutaneous, like you would give insulin. Insulin's a peptide, for example. Oxytocin, they use that in uh, delivering babies uh, and, and to let down milk in a mother. So those have not been banned, but something, some things like thymosin alpha one, especially has been banned for no other reason than they work very well. And they work in post COVID lung patients. It heals the lung tissue where other things just don't. So because of the politics and big pharma, they want to kibosh it. So we have to be, just be careful when recommending or when we can't prescribe many of these anymore. But anyway, there's a lot to it. To, that's a whole hour and a half lecture by itself. But uh, just realize uh, healing peptides in combination or in conjunction with some of the other things I'm mentioning is um, a good, uh, some novel stuff. <clears throat> Another one that's opened up on the scene in the last probably five years is rapamycin. Interesting story about this drug. It was discovered on Easter Island, was found to be helpful in uh, treating fungal infections until they discovered that it was an immunosuppressant. So it came off the market for that condition, but resurfaced when renal transplants were a thing. So doctors were looking for anti-rejection drugs so that when they would give a, a donor kidney to a patient, they wouldn't reject it. And rapamycin amongst other agents were used as anti-rejection drugs. It happens to be the agent that helped discover mTOR. So mTOR is a targeted um, uh, pathway system, the target of rapamycin. It's in the name mTOR. If you look up mTOR, there's a lot of research on it. It's a pathway as well as AMPK pathway. So rapamycin ramps up AMPK and, and basically suppresses or deactivates mTOR. And as that, it has anti-cancer properties, anti-aging, anti-inflammatory properties, anti-autoimmune properties. There's even a, an acute COVID illness protocol using rapamycin. It has to be compounded um, because the full dose that's available at the pharmacy uh, is used for uh, patients with um, transplants, kidney, heart transplants, whatever. And um, the rapamycin that we use 
instead of a daily dose, it's once a week dosing. Okay, so again, find yourself a doctor if you're interested in using rapamycin for not only FM, but other, other disease processes that knows how to prescribe it the proper way. Amloxanox I'll talk about, it's a kind of new on the field, although it's been FDA approved in the topical form for aphthous ulcers of the mouth. It's used in Japan for asthma, anaphylaxis, and allergy, and it's produced by a Japanese pharmaceutical company. It, you can't get it in this country anymore in the 25 and 50 milligram doses. You have to get this one compounded, and we typically use 40 milligrams. We can use it from once a day to sometimes three times a day as an alternative to H1, H2 blockers, monolucast, and high-dose steroids. So H1 blockers are things like Benadryl or Claritin or Zyrtec. H2 blockers are used usually for peptic uh, ulcer disease or reflux, like, like Pepsid or Famotidine. However, they do have antihistamine type 2 properties. And MLK or monolucast, also known as Singulair, is another drug that's used as a leukotriene inhibitor. All of the ones I just mentioned are good for people with MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome, issues with uh, hives, urticaria, allergies, things like that, unstable uh, mast cells. So we see that a lot with chronic Lyme, chronic COVID, a lot of chronic illnesses. It's probably greatly underdiagnosed like POTS can be, um, but uh, this Mloxanox can take the place of all that, especially to a patient who responds very favorably to high dose steroids like prednisone or Medrol. Um, you don't want to keep people on that long term. So maybe after a month or two of high dose prednisone, you taper that off nice and slow and you can replace it with Mloxanox, which is fairly well tolerated to take the place of and use that. Um, there's not a, a lot of um, literature, there's a paucity of evidence-based peer-reviewed literature about this agent with fibromyalgia, so I think further studies uh, need to be developed. But its mechanisms of action correspond with uh, and are favorable to treating a lot of the other symptoms that you see in other conditions like chronic Lyme disease, chronic mold toxicity, uh, heavy metals, etc. So more on this in the future. Okay, mementine, that's an old AD, Alzheimer's disease drug, came out the year I uh, practiced out of training uh, back in the uh, mid to late 1990s. Um, I was, a funny story, I was one of the first doctors in America to prescribe this. I had an AD patient whose wife begged me to uh, do this new drug that's coming out of Germany. It wasn't even FDA approved, wasn't even available. I was able to petition the FDA for compassionate use, got authorization, contacted the company in Germany, which actually they sent me a big box, cardboard box full of samples free of charge that I then passed on to the patient. I can't say that it was a great drug for Alzheimer's disease, but uh, because of its properties, it's known as an NMDA receptor antagonist. It reduces neuroinflammation and it blocks the glutamate uh, pathway or a glutamate uh, blocking agent. And if you, we know that sometimes glutamate is implicated in fibromyalgia and some chronic pain, say chronic regional pain syndromes, um, like so a lot of people will realize this when they eat too much Chinese food, let's say that has MSG in it. So monosodium glutamate is converted to um, uh, the neurotransmitter glutamate in the brain and can cause problems with uh, pain in the gut, pain, pain in the like headaches and things like that. And then NMDA uh, receptors, if they get um, attacked, like an autoimmune disease against those, it can cause a lot of neuroinflammation. And that's probably, in all honesty, the root cause of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and a few others is neuroinflammation. We see that with neuro COVID conditions. So by reducing inflammation in the brain, which Mementine can do, the brand name is Namenda, um, that's another agent that should be considered. Now, one thing I didn't put in here on purpose was methylene blue. So methylene blue was one of the first drugs ever developed. It may have been the first drug ever developed. It started its life in the late 1800s as a dye, as an industrial dye. It's very blue. Anything it spills on will be stained blue. Um, and uh, it was used early on after the discovery of the germ theory to stain slides containing parasites. 
This is right when they found out that um, malaria was caused by a parasite and not by melodious air, hence the name malaria, uh, swamp gases. You know, the British soldiers, when they were fighting the Revolutionary War, avoided swamps because they thought the gases coming off the swamp was causing illness. They did not realize that the mosquito bite carrying a microbe was causing malaria. But when this was the germ theory was discovered, they were starting to stain blood smears and they needed something to stain a microbe. So they used this methylene blue from the dye factories. And lo and behold, they found out that not only did it stain these, these parasites, but it killed them. So then they said, huh, maybe we can give this to people orally to kill the spire, the, the uh, microbes that cause malaria. And lo and behold, it did work. So it became one of the first medical drugs to treat malaria. And it uh, fell out of favor after a while because you know, there's always something new to replace it. But these newer agents wound up, um, the bugs became resistant to it. So now methylene blue is enjoying a res resurgence. And we now use it in treating Lyme patients because it kills parasites, intracellular parasites. And we also use it because it takes out viruses like the COVID virus. So we're using that in our acute and chronic COVID patients, as well as our vaccine injured patients. So methylene blue is, a, is one to consider. However, let me warn you, there are a few things. It is considered a MAOI, antidepressant. And so those, are, if anyone's familiar with that class of antidepressants, you have to be careful with the foods you eat and other medications. Things like um, foods that are aged, like aged cheese, uh, fish that are uh, in cans like tuna and sardines, and other agents, other SSRIs, SNRIs can be dangerous to take with an MAOI drug. And uh, so that's why I didn't really put it on the slides because people have to be careful. You can get methylene blue over the counter without a prescription, but if you don't know what you're doing, you can get yourself in a world of trouble. Uh, you also should have your six, uh, G6PD level check. That's an enzyme in your blood. And if it's low, you may suffer cell lysis and anemia, even life-threatening anemia, if you take too much methylene blue and don't realize you have a deficiency in this enzyme. So because of those things, and a lot of people with fibromyalgia are on SSRIs and SNRIs and things like Ultram for pain that that interact with methylene blue and can be dangerous. So that's why I sort of left it off. But there are scientists that have published work, Dr. Lee, Dr. Martins, and Dr. Gupta are three who have published on the use of methylene blue to help with the chronic pain associated with fibromyalgia. Now, there are typical drugs that mainstream medicine uses, okay? A lot of the agents I just talked about are functional integrative approaches, but mainstream they like to use their amitriptyline, their SNRIs like Cymbalta, which I view duoxetine as a very dangerous and harmful drug. I do not like it. Immediate withdrawal can cause seizures and uh, putting people in the hospital. Um, things like Effexor and Savella. When I was in the emergency room, Savella came out as a FDA approved drug for a four fibromyalgia. And I didn't even know what it was when a woman had come in her doctor had switched her from, I think it was from Cymbalta to Savella without a washout period. And she went into full on serotonin syndrome. She beat up her husband, who was a, a deputy sheriff, was, was like three times her weight. And he came in with bruises all over him. She became extremely hypertensive and her heart weight was elevated. She had to be put in the hospital for a few days to have it washed out and then manage her heart rate and blood pressure. She was in full on serotonin syndrome. I was unfamiliar with the drug because it hadn't really been out, but for a week. So they came in with samples. I had to take the sample, get on the computer and look it up. And lo and behold, I found it, it affected serotonin levels. So hence, that's why she was in serotonin syndrome. I never, ever prescribed that drug. After that episode in the ER, I would never prescribe that drug to anybody, but it's on the list. And then there's pregambulin, Lyrica, Gabapentin. A lot of these doctors are experimenting with really high doses in their patients. Sedatives for sleep, things like uh, benzodiazepines, and of course, Zol uh, Zolpidem, which is Ambien, 
uh, can be a rather dangerous and addicting drug. So I don't prescribe those very often. And if I do for very short periods of time, because if you're on it long term, you get addicted to them. And then SSRIs like Zoloft, Prozac, Paxil, there are many, Celexa. Um, some of these, like Paxil, for instance, is extremely difficult to come off of. You have to go, taper off actually sometimes three to six months in order to get yourself off of those drugs. And there are some tricyclics, um, things like Flexeril, uh, Cyclobenzaprine is an example of that um, that are used traditionally. So some atypical drugs, th some that have had some studies early on in the 2000s, uh, like 2008 or so, there were some publications of Mestinon, uh, which is um, a drug used for myasthenia gravis. It's an uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So it breaks down or, or slows down the, um, the breakdown of acetylcholamine by this enzyme. And in doing so, it gives people more acetylcholine uh, in their systems. And that's helpful with folks suffering from fatigue. Um, so uh, pyrostigmine, uh, or it's called PYD, is also known to inhibit or block somatostatin. Uh, so it's a somatostatin blocking agent used with some success in certain cases of fibromyalgia. Now, there are reports that in some cases, it makes the fibromyalgia worse. So again, there's some things we don't quite understand yet about this drug, and it's been, been used since the uh, early to mid-2000s. I'll just end it on that. Let's talk a bit about some herbals and natural agents that can be used in, uh, in the treatment of fibromyalgia. This is not a um, complete list by any stretch, but this is uh, the basics. So there's magnesium. Now there's different kinds of magnesiums. There's magnesium citrate and oxide that one would use for constipation, whereas magnesium malate, glyphosate, uh, glyconate, I'm sorry, and um, aspartate and magnesium l 3 n 8 which crosses the blood-brain barrier nicely, are agents to use uh, for pain control. Um, unless you're constipated, um, you know, that's when you'd use citrate or oxide. Those are poorly absorbed, but uh, malate's good and l 3 n 8s great. Uh, malic acid, 5-HTP on the pathway to serotonin, SAMe, S-aminylmethionine uh, is used as a Again, it's in that kind of pathway towards creating serotonin and eventually melatonin. Um, you have omega-3 fatty acids, which is like fish oil or krill oil. You can get algae-based if you're a vegetarian or vegan. And, and then there are some plant-based omegas, but it requires the body to make a conversion. So they're not the first to go to. Uh, melatonin I mentioned, and that's great in use in combination with other agents. High dose, we're talking 10 to 20 milligrams, sustained release even, and only take melatonin at night. There's coenzyme Q10, curcumin. The spice is called turmeric, so I don't refer to it as turmeric. I refer to it as curcumin, which is the active ingredient. And there's Boswellia serrata, which is it's usually paired up with for anti-inflammatory purposes. Ginger is used, ginseng, and other adaptogen herbs. Now, some uh, combinations are used. You'll find a product that combines curcumin, ginger, and boswellia. And um, so there, there's options too. Remember, some of these are not very well absorbed. So always get the best pharmaceutical grade products if you can. Willow bark. Of course, we know willow bark for its um, salicylic acid, which is found in aspirin, again, for pain and inflammation. Astragalus, go to cola, quercetin, and Chinese skull cap which is very good at suppressing quinolinic acid or quin, which is on the kynurian pathway, kind of a deviation from the pathway of tryptophan to melatonin. It kind of deviates and goes down a different metabolic pathway, halfway to um, uh, NAD plus, if you will, there's something called quinolinic acid, which is a neuroirritant. So melatonin and skullcap do very well about squashing that and I see that a lot in my Lyme patients with neurological Lyme and in our um, vaccine injured people with neurological COVID. A gluten uh, free diet and good clean diet is always recommended. Physical therapy. You've got uh, pulsed electromagnetic therapies, biofeedback, neuro um, retraining, because there's neuroplasticity. So EMDR and some others. 
uh, nair infrared therapy, light therapy, you can get out in the sun, do it naturally, or if you want to get a sauna that has nair infrared in it, that's the expensive way of doing it. There's also sound and music therapies. Exercise is important. There have been many studies showing exercise, if you can get a fibromyalgia patient to do it, will in the you know, the return on that investment is huge. Once you get over the hump and you feel pretty good about exercise and what tolerance you have, it um, turn, turns out to be very helpful, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, then you have essential oils that may be helpful for some, like lavender, chamomile, and peppermint. So I meant, I told you, I promised you I would mention some things. So for more information on low-dose naltrexone, you can go to the LDN Research Trust website, and there's a lots of information. It's a great uh, source of references, references and resources. Uh, they even have a site there where you can find a doctor close to where you live that will prescribe it. There's also three books that have been written through uh, over the last four or five years entitled the LDN book. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble online. The third volume is probably the easiest to read. So I would recommend maybe starting with volume three first. It talks about the mechanisms of actions and how, you know, how it works. And, and then there are different chapters on different chronic illnesses in there. Um, I've aligned myself with two um, hemp companies that provide CBD and other cannabinoids like CBN, CBG, as well as some other products I'll get in, um, in, in touch with you about. Uh, they come in different forms, liquids, gummies, topicals. Um, and the um, Ananda is one out of, I think, Kentucky, big company. They do a lot of heavy-duty research on their cannabinoids, and they've come out with um, oral capsules, liquids, gummies, um, and also some topicals um, for skin um, conditions. Um, like if you have a swollen or inflamed elbow, you can rub it on the elbow to reduce that inflammation. The Cotton Patch Hemp Company is in my home state of South Carolina. Uh, they're kind of affiliated somewhat with Clemson University. They independently test every batch. I've actually been to their farm to see how they grow it and how they process it. Very clean stuff. One product they have in particular is called Trifecta. It has three agents, CBD, CBG, and Delta-8. And it's great for people with anxiety disorder, depression, and especially insomnia. You take three or four drops of this on your tongue at bedtime, and uh, it will very be very, very helpful with sleep. Um, peptides, again, resourcing and finding them is very difficult these days because of FDA overreach, in my opinion. Uh, but the BPC-157 by integrative peptides is in an oral form. They also have a mouth spray and some other products. They don't typically have the injectables. Peptide Sciences is a company um, that produces very high-end peptides, mostly injectable, some in combinations, like they'll take two or three uh, peptides like BPC-157 and KPV and one other in an oral capsule form. They also have the majority in um, dry powders and vials that you reconstitute with bacteriostatic water, and then you keep it in the fridge and you inject it subcutaneously. And there are resources to know how to mix it up and how to inject, whether it's once a day, you know, twice a day or once uh, or twice a week. So in closing, I just want to say that um, treating folks with fibromyalgia is a very personalized precision medicine way of doing things. You can't cookie cutter it because almost every single patient like as with all my other patients with chronic illness, like Lyme disease or long COVID, everyone's individual, everyone presents a little bit different and everyone really deserves uh, a bit of personalized, unique interventions customized for their particular needs. So make sure you find the right doctor who's willing to spend an hour, hour and a half with you in each session and customize a plan specifically for you and your needs. You can't accomplish this with a 10-minute visit with your provider. It just doesn't happen. Um, very difficult to formulate a plan that's comprehensive and cohesive when you're only in there uh, with your doctor for 10 minutes. So seek out folks that um, can provide a little bit more personalized attention. And I just want to thank everyone. Um, if you have questions, um, I, I did post my professional 
email address dr.salibi at carolinaholisticmedicine.com. If you wouldn't mind, if you're from this uh, conference or an attendee here and want to reach out to me, please reference that in the subject heading saying, you know, the COVID, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, fibromyalgia conference 2023 in the subject. And then you can ask me a question. I also have some of my administrative assistants and registered nurses man this web uh, address uh, because of the huge number of emails I get, but it will be answered. Um, And um, if it's something my nursing staff cannot answer directly, they will forward it on to me. You can also go to salibi.net. That is sort of a page that explains my biography and other links and other things I'm involved with.